بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين and welcome to Ramadan dates. One of the articles of belief for a believer for a Muslim is to believe in the hereafter. And we all know that the hereafter has two parts. There is uh, paradise for those who are successful and there is hellfire for those that are not. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from hell and grant us eternal paradise inshallah. With us to discuss this uh, juicy topic as I would say is Sheikh Bilal Asad. Welcome Sheikh. Thank you very much for having me. Sheikh Bilal, if I was to ask you to describe paradise for me in two minutes, how would you describe it? Wow, two minutes. In it, there are things that no eye has ever seen or ear has ever heard, and things which no heart has ever even felt. Which no heart has ever even felt. Everything you could ever imagine, from the beginning of Adam till the end of time, all the creativity, all the Hollywood movies that have put it in such a magical way for people to believe things that are not true. Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, in Jannah there are things that no feeling has ever even reached. You know what that means? What does that mean? It means that, you know how sometimes we have a feeling and we don't know how to describe it? Like a hunch. A feeling. You, something happens in front of you, you get kind of a sad feeling, emotional feeling, inspirational feeling, happy feeling. But sometimes it reaches such an extreme point that there's no words to put in any language to describe that feeling. That's in this world. Rasul says in Jannah there are things that you haven't even reached that, that is actually beyond that even. That you have never experienced in the most subtle of feelings. You can never feel it in this world. You can never imagine it in this world. Ever. Jannah, my brother, Akhi Malad, the viewers, is a garden full of greenery and colors that you have never imagined. There is no bad in it. All the negative feelings are taken out of the soul. So every negative feeling is no longer there. There is no jealousy. There is no hatred. There is no grudge. There is no depression. There is no anxiety. And you don't know why, but you always feel happy and you love it. And that happiness only increases beyond measure. With every day? Every second. There's no time. And there's so much to do. And if you run out of imaginations, the angels give you ideas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to you. You speak to him. You see Allah in the Quran. In Surah Al-Qiyamah, you see Allah says, وَجُوهُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ نَاظِرَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَ Faces brightened. They're watching Allah, their Lord. And when you see Allah, all that beauty in Jannah that took your breath away and your mind away, you forget it. Because Allah is more beautiful than all of that. SubhanAllah. Allah says in the Quran, Whoever enters paradise will live forever in happiness and never will they ever feel a feeling of negativity. That's what I can say in two minutes. SubhanAllah. What do you personally look for forward to in Jannah? <laughs> Speaking and seeing Allah. No, 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 no. How can I not? This, this is something that everybody thrives for and, and, and strives for. I'm going to see Allah? Some people went to the point where I don't even believe that I'm going to see Allah. How are you going to see Allah? It's true. Allah never doesn't keep hiding himself. Yani Allah has never hid himself. But yani he's, he's hidden from our eyes. But we can see his creation. creation. Ibn Taymiyyah says, I think my belief in the existence of Allah is more firm in my heart than people's existence. But in Jannah, to see Allah and to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tell him how you feel, that's the most ultimate thing. Ah, subhanallah. What do you look for in Jannah? I look forward to seeing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alayhi wa sallam. You know, having his companionship, you know, sort of, we've, we've heard about him, heard his tradition, you know, the hadith, all this, the seerah that we've heard. I mean, I long to actually just spending time with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everyone does. And there's no time, right? You don't have to make an appointment. There could be a dimensional times, if you like. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can see many people at the same time. You know, sometimes I think like, like a child about Jannah. Every time you hear about Jannah, all of us are reduced to that childhood imagination. Yes. All that stuff we used to think about as, as children, and we get older and we think, yeah, reality. You can now go back to that childhood imagination. And I, sometimes I think, I want to make a world of my own, heck, little, little world of my own, 
And I'd like to see how it happens. I'd like to go back in time in the world. I'd like to fly. I want to swim in an ocean full of the most... I want to speak to fish. <laughs> I want to be Aquaman. I want to be uh, all these other things. And uh, I want to yani, think of all these things that in this world can never have been a reality and my imagination never run out. How do you think all these rewards that we look forward to in Jannah can drive us to be better Muslims on this, in this dunya? Uh, you see, that's the ultimate thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps repeating in the Quran saying, uh, do for a Jannah which is larger than the universe and the earth put together. Do for a higher reward in which this happens and in that happens and look what I'm going to give you. And the Quran is repeated over and over again. You see, brother, when I feel hurt by someone because of my religiosity or because of my character in a good way, yani, or because of who I am at work with your spouse, with your children, with your parents, with your friends, with the enemies and non-enemies, you always remember, there's going to come a time when I'm going to be relieved from that. And no matter how rock bottom you hit in this world, you think... <laughs> If I'm patient enough, there is a time when all of that is going to be paid off. So every time I put Jannah in my mind, I think, you know what, nothing's going to be lost. That's okay. And that harm which you see before your eyes, the fact that you can think of somewhere safe and beautiful in which you will never hear harm ever again, and that will be to your credit, you think, you know what, my Jannah is being built. My Jannah is growing by me being patient with that. It's a tremendous effect when a person keeps Jannah in their mind. This is a great reward. There's a time where you're going to be relieved and paid back. There's a time when all your worries and everything you've ever felt, all the cheating that you feel, felt people had given you, or the betrayals, or the good or the bad, you know that it's going to be paid off. And in Jannah, you are going to receive more and uh, be compensated. That's what people want. They want to be compensated. They want to be heard. They want to... So subhanAllah, ya khi, how, how can I express that? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the people of Jannah and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same way that has gathered us here, mm-hmm. gather us uh, in Jannah with the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We'll go to a break and when we come back we'll be speaking about hellfire. Ramadan days. Ramadan is a time for giving generously to those less fortunate. Your generosity will help distribute food packs to over 20,000 families. You can feed a family of five for the whole month of Ramadan for just $50. With a 100% donation policy and no admin fees. Donate this Ramadan to maximize your rewards at sadaka.org.au. Ramadan day. Welcome back to Ramadan Dates. Jahannam or hellfire is something that is uh, that we are sort of asked you know, to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to protect us from it because some of the verses of the Quran are very, very powerful, very, very scary, the torment, the punishment. How would you describe hellfire in two minutes? Very, very, very painful. Burning. Burning and pain doesn't run out. Pain after pain. Burning after burning. Screaming. Regret. Depression. Anxiety. Fear. Hurt. Pain. Loss. Wanting to kill yourself, but you can't. You love death, but you can't even get that. Regret, regret, regret. And it's never ending. It it traumatizes me. So just hearing about hellfire, I get very scared, of course. If it wasn't for Allah talking about His mercy and Jannah, I don't think anyone can enjoy their life at all here in this life. Every aspect of negativity that you can think of is in hellfire. And just like Allah describes that in Jannah, there's things no one's ever imagined of beauty. In hellfire, there are things that no person has ever imagined of pain and harm and torture. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I don't, even, I don't even see it. Or smell it, inshallah. Or smell it or hear it. And I feel very, very sad for anyone else who would be destined to it. How is a Muslim supposed to view the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? A Muslim views Allah's punishment between something called hope and fear. 
Allah said in the Quran, Fafirru ila Allah, inni lakum minhu nadhirun mubin. One of the prophets of Allah, Allah quoted him to have said to his people, Run away. Run away to Allah. I am to you from him a clear warner. As if he's saying, Run away from the punishment of Allah and your distancing from Allah and seek safety and protection with Allah. I can't imagine anybody who is afraid of something and the only salvation and mercy they can get is by going to that something that they fear. Hellfire calls me to go closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hellfire is a form of Allah's mercy actually. When the murderer hears about hellfire and Allah warns them, it's only to protect the innocent people. When the rapist hears about hellfire, it's so Allah can protect people, the victims. When Allah talks about it, it's in order to safeguard the others who are innocent and not deserving of this. Hope that Allah will always forgive me. So I will strive to him. Can I tell you a very quick 30 second story about my daughter? Of course. Okay, because that's what I can think of. She was three years old. And she did something wrong. So I got upset with her. And I frowned. She got scared. I thought she was going to run away. You well, know what she, she did? She ran to you. She ran to me. And I'm pushing her off and she's getting more terrified. Not of me, of something else. And I started thinking, like, I said, what is this? So I put her in my lap and she slept. She felt safe. Ya Tura. What was that all about? Taqwa Allah. Fear of Allah. There is nothing negative about the belief in Allah, even if you hear about hellfire. Even if you're scared. Even these scary verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they are screaming out of agony and pain. This is only out of the mercy of Allah. Why would Allah tell us about a future torment right now and describe it in such detail and then advises us how to get out of it and how to come back to him and then talks to us about his mercy and his forgiveness? Why? You know, when you're about to do exams or you're about to go for something, an achievement in life, your parents come and they tell you the good and the bad about life, the suffering in the future. Why do they say that? To give you anxiety? To make you depressed? No. A caring parent does it because they care for you. They don't want to see you falling into it. So Allah tells us about hellfire. And this is what Allah says, think of me in a positive way. Even if he talks about hellfire. It's because Allah is warning me. He doesn't want me to enter it. What about when he says, I'll replace your skin with thicker skin and the punishment will continue to, to happen? All of this is to warn us not to go into that area. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, see, the more he tells us how bad it is, and, 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 and I insist on continuing to disobey and I insist on continuing to go against him. Now, disobedience, of course, there's minor and major sins. Allah knows you're going to disobey. But he says this in such detail and to that extreme, and still that person will refuse to follow a good life and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, what else are you going to say? Like if, if, if I told you, hey, listen, you better not be bad. Because then, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to put a fly in your drink. Ooh. You're going to take that as a joke. Not that scary. Uh, a murderer, rapist, extremist. A cheater, a liar, a thief, a bully. If I say your punishment, at school once I, my cousin made fun of me with this one. I stood up and I said, okay, boys and girls, if you continue talking and distracting people of prayer, I'm going to keep you in for one minute. <laughs> they all go, ha, 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 one minute. Not that serious. I'm not that serious. It. But if I keep telling him the dangers of what can happen, then you're going to start thinking, you know what? If I'm an evil person, I better stop here, man. The fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fearing to lose the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not his punishment. Not his punishment. Fearing, leave, fearing losing his love because you don't want to begin to think about what can happen. Like my daughter, she doesn't know what I'll do, but she's afraid of something. But do you see that as a bigger loss, the fact that you've lost the love of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as opposed to the fear of the punishment itself? The biggest loss is losing Allah's love. You having that connection and relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because only that... You cannot imagine what can happen after that. If, Allah, if, if you leave Allah and Allah leaves you, who's going to be there for you? Everything negative. Because Allah does not have one negative name in His 99 names. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءِ الْحُسْنَى 
Not one name of Allah is negative and frightening. What about, for example, Shadid al Iqab? Shadid al Iqab is also merciful. Shadid al Iqab, Iqab means the deserving of people, the, the, what people deserve of punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is severe in that. So come back. Look, it's like the parent. The father says, Look, if you don't straighten yourself up and stop the drugs and stop hanging out with people with drugs, then it's going to be a terrible, terrible end for you. And I will not be there to help you anymore because you deserved it. Maybe you need to go through the prison. Maybe you need to go through that so you can wake up. And if you don't wake up in the end, what can I do for you, son or daughter? Now, is the father saying that or the mother saying that because they want you to, to end up in there? Of course not. They're warning you the most severe cases. You're going to die. Do you understand? Someone's going to, I'm going to find you in the middle of the street. Someone slit your throat and cut your bodies into pieces. Is that because the father or mother are trying to traumatize you? Absolutely not. They're trying to tell you how bad it is so that you can move away and protect yourself. Come back to your family. Come back and seek the, the safety of your father and mother and your family. Find your happiness. Oh, that's what Allah is saying. Come back. How does one sort of strike a balance between having the hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's reward, which is paradise, and the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment, hellfire? Ya akhi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly reminds us of his mercy and his forgiveness. But it has to be sincere. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed by the graves of the shuhada and by the graves of who, had, who are in al baqiyah the companions who had died and been buried there, about two months before he died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he knew that it was close to his death because Jibreel alayhi salam came and made him read the, recite the Qur'an in the Ramadan twice. twice. Although he used to and do it once before. Once before. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa knew this is a sign of his end. He passed by the grave and he was sad. And the Sahabi was with him, I think it was Abu Dhar, Allahu A'lam. And he said, oh, I'm going to miss meeting my brothers. And the Sahabi said, where are your brothers, Ya Rasulullah? Here we are, what do you mean, miss? Like, uh, you mean you're going to die and miss us? He said, no, no. Antum Ashabi, you're my companions. The ones I'm talking about are the ones who haven't come yet. They're not born yet. They will believe in me even though they have never seen me. I just, that's the only thing I will miss. I don't want anything from this world. I miss Allah more than anyone. And I just want to meet him. And that's, I just want to go. But I'm going to miss my brethren, the Muslim men and women. And I ask Allah that we are those Amen. among them. I will miss seeing them. They believed in me, no, they never saw me. Allah gave me and every prophet a special dua that was. Uh, specific for every prophet to ask. Other than every other dua, there was one specific one every prophet had that will never be refused. And each one took his dua already. As for me, I left it for the hereafter. On the day of judgment, the people will go to every prophet and none of them could help them. They'll go to Adam, Ibrahim, no All of them, all of them. And then finally they'll come to me. And I have a right. I still have a dua. So he saved his dua for the hereafter. Listen, Malad, what he saved it for. He will prostrate to Allah a prostration he has never prostrated the likes of before. Then he will say things to Allah of dua and dhikr that he had never said before. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inspiring. In a time when Allah has never been angry the way he's been angry on that day. And Allah will say to him, Irfa ra'sak ya Muhammad. Sallallahu lift your head up. Ask me to save whoever you want. Ask me anything else and I will give it to you. Allah gave that honor for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam out of his own mercy. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will stand up. And what will he say? Allahumma ummati ummati. Oh Allah, my nation, my nation. Those who followed me. He doesn't ask about himself. Ya Rabbi Ummati Ummati. Every other prophet will say, Nafsi, Nafsi. Myself, myself. Not out of selfishness. Everyone's concerned for it's their scared. own state. Yeah, it's a difficult done. day. And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, I saved my dua for this day. Who is the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Every person that believed in him and Allah and didn't make any shirk. So there are people who prayed on and off. Some of them who were lazy in their actions. Some of them who did major sins. These are the people Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is calling out. He's not talking about the Sahabas and all those who are guaranteed paradise. He's talking about the others 
who are going to be destined to hellfire. Yeah, some Muslims, some Muslims will be destined to hellfire. May Allah protect us. And is, is that the end for them? Or? Uh -huh. So some of them have already entered hellfire. Some of them are destined. Some of them are on the verge. So Allah gives them their books and everything and the scales to see how heavy your deeds were and what they're really worth. Some people showed it off, some people didn't. And some people are going to be destined. They go dragging on their faces. Some of them, they don't know what's going to happen. Some of them fall. So then the person who memorized the Quran and acted upon it, Allah will say, take 10 members of your family out. The person who struggled and strived and died in the cause of good and protection of Muslims and the innocent and for justice, Allah will say, take out this many number of people from hellfire. And then there'll still be Muslims in hellfire. Rasul will come back and he cannot rest. Even in Jannah, he cannot enjoy it. SubhanAllah. Can you imagine that? He enjoys Jannah, of course, but he's still got his mind on them. On us. Oh, no. Inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah, we're not one of those who are in hellfire. Inshallah. But he'll come back to us. Us as in the Ummah of Rasulullah. The Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Rab, save them, save them. There's still members of people in, in, in hellfire, Ya Rab. So Allah then finally says to the angels, go and every person has a, a little mark on his forehead. I mean, yeah, at least they prayed on and off. At least on and off. And every person who had Tawheed, worshipped Allah alone with La ilaha illallah and never made shirk with me, take them out. SubhanAllah, some of them are murderers, some of them are rapists, some of them were, 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 did zina and all that stuff. Obviously, they've paid for what they have done wrong. And Allah says, take them out. All of them will be saved. Not one will be left with Tawheed, abadan. Hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. Until they enter paradise. And that's when an angel comes and gets a sheep and says, O people of Hellfire and, and Jannah. And the Hellfire people think, oh, maybe we're going to get out. Hold on, news. Is it good or is it bad? The people of Jannah think the opposite. They think, oh no, come on. We've just entered. Do you think there's a change of mind or something? And the angel says, this is death. And he slaughters death and says, no more death after here. People of Hellfire stay in for eternity. People of Jannah for eternity. Subhanallah. So Allah's mercy is right to the last minute. But this is not to say that just because eventually I hope that we'll enter paradise, that we continue our sins, not tricking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day in hellfire is like a thousand years of what we count. May Allah protect us. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. I advise all of my brothers and sisters never to give up hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa la taqnatu min rahmatillah. Allah says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ Say, O oh, my worshippers who have regretted and, and, and put too much burden on themselves. Allah, Allah says, listen, I know you sinned, I know, but you're thinking that I'm, that I'm that angry with you, but I'm not. You know, you've burdened yourself, you've overburdened yourself. أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ They exceeded too much, they went too extreme with themselves. All right, I know that you've done lots of private haram things, you've done a few haram things out here, even major things, and you feel that you're never going to enter hell, um, heaven, Jannah. Don't give up on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Allah forgives all sins, all sins, everything. Jami'a, all of it, all together. So the condition is come to me. Turn to me again and again and again and again and again and again, a thousand times, a million times. But don't just stay where you are. Always come back. SubhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the people of, uh, of Jannah, of eternal Jannah. And may he save us all from the punishment of hellfire. Sheikh Bilal Asad, Jazakallah khair for being with us. And I hope that you've enjoyed today's episode. Uh, thank you for watching Ramadan Dates. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.